Hello, I'm Anita Steberg. I am the CEO and founder of the Steberg Law Firm, a law firm in San Jose, California, where we help people with tax, probate, trust, and estate issues. And we are very passionate about helping in those areas. And I want to talk to you about the overview of an elder abuse case. Now, I would love to tell you that it is uh, that when you go to court, it's like you see on Matlock or LA Law. Um, and if you don't know what those are, I'm probably a little bit older than you, um, but that they are exactly as you see on TV, and it is a very quick process. I would like to tell you that, but I can't because I'm not naive, and nor do I want to lie to you, bring you down a rosy path. Um, from the in Santa Clara County, from the time that you file a lawsuit until you get to trial, it's generally about two years. In other counties, it's a little bit quicker in the Bay Area, but in Santa Clara County, it's about two years. Now, that doesn't mean that you filed a petition um, or the complaint, either in probate court or civil court, um, depending on the matter, and you're just twiddling your thumbs. So let's talk about an overview of an elder abuse case. So if you are thinking of either you're involved in a case or you're thinking about bringing a case, let's talk about what, the, what that is so that we, you have some type of working knowledge. So for an elder abuse case, I'm gonna make some assumptions. And the assumption that I'm going to make is that we're not in civil court, although you can be under uh, certain situations, but it's going the process is going to be similar. But I'm gonna assume that we're in probate court and we are going to allege some type of petition for elder abuse. We're going to try to, um, you know, this elder individual, your loved one um, has been taken advantage of, whether it's through a new estate plan, whether it's through neglect, um, whether it is through harassment or um, psychological abuse or physical abuse, something has happened. And we now need to protect, you need to protect your loved one, your elderly parent is most common. So the first thing you do is schedule an appointment with an attorney, somebody um, like me who has dedicated uh, their professional life to standing up for elderly individuals, somebody who is familiar with the statute, somebody who does this day in and day out because it will take an aggressive litigator in order to protect the rights of the loved one, it's, especially if the loved one is uh, has lost capacity. And what I mean by that is they're confused. They have some type of dementia or um, cognitive disability or cognitive issue where if I told you, well, just give me your house, you'd be like, Nita, I don't know you. I'm not giving you my house, but I, yet I can manipulate your loved one to give me their house. So, um, you know, they're, that's what I mean, that they are able to be influenced. They, they've they lost the rationality to say, no, no, that's not what I want. They can be manipulated. It's called undue influence. So the first thing uh, that you do is we talk about, uh, we talk about the facts and circumstances surrounding it. So we have an idea that we can help you. Once we've been retained, we start working on getting the facts and circumstances and we uh, prepare a petition that'll be filed. And like I said, in this scenario, it's going to be probate court in Santa Clara County. And we file that and we get a hearing date. We get a hearing date and a hearing time. And that has to be served on all parties. Who are all parties? Well, it depends on if there's an estate plan, if it's an, if they don't have an estate plan, who the people, who the abusers are. So we, uh, when in the course of preparing the petition, we help identify the individuals who have to be noticed under the probate code. We file the petition, we get it gets assigned in due course, a case number as well as a hearing date. We serve those individuals. And because there is a lot of time a lag, for example, earlier this month, I filed a petition uh, with the probate court, the first hearing that is available is in December. We just got it back today. 
It took about two weeks for the court to process. And that hearing date is in about three months away, two and a half to three months. So there is a lag. Now, that doesn't mean that once it's served, um, once it's served, we can start the process called discovery. Discovery occurs um, in every civil, uh, every civil and probate case um, if it is adversarial. And what discovery is just a fancy word means we're going to get evidence. We are able to send written discovery out to the parties that are involved, basically um, send them written questions, send them written requests for documents. They have to respond in writing. We can also send out subpoenas, which means we can get information from third parties, such as banks, such as um, even in some cases, attorney's records. Um, we can uh, get it from uh, notaries. We can, you know, wherever we can send out uh, subpoenas that says, give us this information. And we get that. That is not a quick process. Generally, especially if it's going to a financial institution, it may take 60 to 90 days for them to respond and provide it to us. Um, so we have that going on. We can also informally um, interview potential witnesses, either at witnesses that are adversarial to our side to find out what they believe or what they saw, what they, uh, what they have firsthand knowledge of, as well as friendly witnesses. Now, if they won't talk to us, you say, but Anita, I don't, you know, my, this person's going to say they don't want to get involved. Okay, that's fine. Um, if it is something that we need to talk to, we have the power once the petition's filed and it's been served to depose those individuals, which means that um, they can be ordered by the court to show up at a place, as long as we give them notice of it, um, where they can need to uh, answer questions in real time. This is not written. This is a um, this is a real time question and answer. So we uh, we have that, and both parties are going to be doing this. Um, they want to see what evidence you, we have or what evidence we don't have. I'm and we need to know what evidence they have or what they don't have or what facts go against our case, what facts are favorable to our case so that we can shore up the case. In most cases that go to litigation, there is not all good facts or all bad facts. Those cases generally, if they see the um, see the courtroom, they are very easy to dispose of because everything is either for or against. A lot of cases, it is a mix of some good facts and some bad facts. You may have a lot more good facts than bad facts, but you're kind of in, um, but not everything is 100% lined up in your favor and against the other party. So both parties are going to be shoring up the evidence, looking at what their weaknesses are. If there are uh, some facts that are not as favorable, you're going to go out and you're going to find the best facts. Um, at some point, uh, let's just say three months have elapsed and we've started this process, we have a hearing. At that hearing, it's called a status hearing. And the judge just checks in with the individuals to say what's been done and to set out a future status date. Um, the court just wants to make sure that the cases are moving forward. And there's going to be a series of those throughout the process. Every 60 to 90 days is not uncommon. And the parties continue with discovery. At some point, you're going to do what's called alternative dispute resolution. The most common is mediation. Um, and the court can even order under some, some situations, the court can order the parties to go to alternative dispute resolution or mediation. And mediation is just a process where a third party neutral is involved and to see if the maybe with some help that the parties can reach an agreement. The advantage of mediation is you can get very creative and you can craft your own solution. 
The bad part is that the mediator cannot force anybody to accept a uh, accept a resolution, they accept a settlement. It both parties have to voluntarily say yes, that is acceptable to me. So you go to you've done all of your discovery, you've gone to uh, some type of mediation, maybe there's also been settlement talks and the case is not resolved. At some point, the judge is going to say, okay, we're going to go to trial. Now, depending on the facts and circumstances, one of the witnesses may be what's called an expert witness, which means it may be um, for an elder abuse case, it's not uncommon for it to be a doctor or a neuropsychologist who can determine, look at all the evidence and opine whether that person was unduly influenced, whether that loved one, the elderly individual had the uh, cognitive ability to understand exactly what they were doing. Um, generally around this time is where we start looking at expert witnesses. Sometimes it's done earlier than that, but at least as when we know it's going to trial, is when we start getting uh, serious about expert witnesses. And the court will give us a trial date. In Santa Clara County, if the trial is going to be more than say three hours, it is not going to be heard in the probate court. Instead, the probate court will say this, you know, we'll ask each side for an estimate of the time it will take to try their case. Let's just say it's five days. The judge, the probate judge will say, okay, I need to put this on a trial setting calendar of Judge X um, and the next hearing date will be in Judge X's courtroom where you will actually set the trial date. That trial date, depending on the judge's calendar, can be anywhere from 30 to 180 days out. Part of it depends on what discovery still needs to be done. Um, what the uh, availability of the parties are, as well as the court's availability. So you can now get a trial date. Generally in Santa Clara County, the Wednesday before the trial occurs, there is a mandatory settlement conference, which the court pays for a third party neutral to come in and see, make one last stab at see if the parties can resolve this amongst themselves through a settlement. If it doesn't resolve, no problem. Everybody goes home. They show back up at the court at the trial day, um, and you start and you start going for trial. Trials are extremely stressful for an attorney. Um, if you're in trial, uh, my day if I'm in trial generally starts at 6 a.m. I'm preparing for that day. Um, the day, make sure my notes are in order, getting the information that I will need, um, meet the client at the courthouse between eight and nine. Trial starts, let's say a regular day between 9, 30, 10 o'clock. Um, the judge may have some preliminary stuff to take care of, but then he will start the trial and maybe even has preliminary stuff has to do with your case. Maybe there a party filed a motion in order to exclude some evidence called motion in limine. Um, he will take care of that, and then they will start the day of trial. It's not uncommon for trials to go until four or five at night. Um, then I will, uh, between the time I leave, that the we leave the courtroom, uh, probably for about another hour, hour and a half, spend with the client, debrief, have a quick dinner. And then I start the, as an attorney, we start the um preparation for the next day. And so I'm, you know, seven o'clock making my notes for the next day, reviewing what happened at court that day. Um, if I, you're in the middle of um, a witness, uh, you know, um, seeing what the witness testified to, because maybe you're going to be crossing them the next day, um, making sure you have all of the evidence, looking at your evidence and determining, are you, do you need to change exhibits? Um, you're preparing for the next day and that goes until anywhere 9, 10, 11, midnight, get a couple hours sleep as much as you can, um, start it all at six o'clock the next morning. So, um, from a client perspective, they are aware, you know, they're getting ready to 
they're doing the same thing in their head. They are getting prepared for the for that day. They wake up in the morning. They get prepared for the day. Show up at the courthouse. Uh, spend the full day in the courtroom with their attorney. Um, debrief an hour or so after the court. Answer questions. Um, the client goes one way. The attorney goes the other. And then you meet up in for the next morning. So it's extremely long days. And at the end of the trial, the uh, there's a verdict get, given. Um, because we're in civil courts, not criminal courts, it's not you are guilty of, it is what they are, what the court finds the, per, the party's liable for. If you're uh, been accused of elder abuse, it is did they did um, did they find that the person's liable for it? And what are the what are the the damages? So you end up with a trial. Um, if they are found liable for it, you end up with a judgment from the court, um, and then you can execute on that judgment. There's still a little bit more that you have to do with that judgment, but that is basically the anatomy of a um, elder abuse case in probate court. If you file it in civil court, it's a very similar process. Um, with there's a couple of nuances. Um, for example, instead of filing a petition, you file a summons and complaint, but the process is still the same. So I hope that's helpful. If you find that your um, loved one's being taken advantage of, um, I hope that, uh, you know, it's mm, probably not saying this correctly, but if your loved one is being taken advantage of, you need to take action now to protect them. And you can contact us now to discuss your case and where we can go over what options are available. So thank you so much. And I hope that you have a wonderful day.